Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to Voices from the Bench. We are at episode number 78. My name is Elvis. My name is Barbara. So tell me, Elvis, how did your... Oops. We are here at House of the Doll with uh, six dogs in the background. Uh, Barb and I usually record on a Friday, but we're recording on a Sunday because I was at the DS Marketing Summit over the weekend. I got three dogs wanting to play with a dog that doesn't want to do anything. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> so how was the DS Marketing Summit? I saw you on Facebook. You got tons of likes. You said that you had faced your fear. And um, you felt like you put on a really good seminar. How did it go? So the summit itself was was an amazing experience. They had so many great speakers. You know, not a ton of attendees, but it was quality attendees. There were people that were really interested. Have you ever been to the uh, Dent Supply Serona building, the new one? No, I haven't. I wish I would have been there, to be honest. Oh, my gosh. They have quite the facility. So did you like speaking? I did. I, you know, I was super nervous before I did the first one, but once I got going, it got easier. And when I did the second one on the second day, I was rocking it. And it was, I really kind of liked it. I liked people paying attention. I had some questions. People laughed when they were supposed to laugh. I really enjoyed it, but I want to give a shout out to the few friends that I had that came to see me speak because it was nice to have a familiar face in the audience. Bennett Napier was there. Megan Nakanishi was there. Martha Martin. And she brought her super cool marketing manager, Blair Burns. And they were constantly telling me not to be nervous. Everything will be fine. you know. And it was nice to have that support. Oh, that's great. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. I, I kind of like the speaking thing. It's kind of it's it's weird. Well, you created a podcast and you, uh, you know, like to talk and you're very inventive. And I think that's awesome. I'm, there. I'm sorry I wasn't, but um, congratulations. Yeah. A lot of people were asking, is Barb here? Where's Barb? Is Barb coming? Where's Barb? Aww. I think we need to keep doing this as the duo. Really do. Okay. Well, thank you. That makes me happy. I thought you were going to cut off your right arm there for a sec. Just kidding. <laughs> Never. Never, but I will be speaking again coming up at the Eastern Conference of Dental Laboratories on November 8th and 9th, so I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. But at the DS Marketing Summit, I did get a couple of interviews. I didn't get a lot because it was class-based. I mean, people went from one room to the other to the other, and not a lot of time in between, but I did meet some amazing people. And the the interviews we'll have coming out here pretty soon. They're very cool. Really looking forward to it. So everybody stay tuned for that. I I got some good ones. So very seldom do we get to talk to somebody right before they do really great things. Usually we find out about something after it happens. But Elvis and I had a chance to talk with Katie Rinaldo from Illinois. And what Katie is doing is something we have talked about on the podcast before. Imagine that, Elvis, you and I doing something great. Katie just some passion and a lot of grassroots marketing wants to make denturism legal in Illinois. She went from an art student to a removable technician to learning how to get a bill passed, which is not an easy feat. Not always an easy journey, but join us as we chat with Katie Ronaldo. Digital Dental's FDA-approved custom abutment solution is a great way to bring custom abutment milling in-house. It allowing your lab to control turnaround times and dramatically reduce your costs versus outsourcing. With systems compatible with Nobel, Strawman, BioHorizon, Hyosin, Astrotech, Zimmer, Biomet, and more, you can manufacture a wide range of custom abutments for under $40 per unit in under 30 minutes, which is pretty darn fast, I gotta say. Digital Dental's complete solution features a custom milling machine, an extensive selection of abutment blanks, and a turnkey FDA compliance program, which we all know how important that is. Go to www.digitaldental.com forward slash abutment for more information and see how easy it is to get started milling the FDA approved custom abutments in-house.
Voices from the Bench. The Interview. So joining us today is someone who I met via Facebook. This lady is super active on Facebook, trying to push something she truly believes in. And Barb and I, I think, both believe in this. But joining us today is Katie Ronaldo from Illinois, who's going through the motions and the fight to make denturism legal in that state. Katie, how are you today? Hi, guys. I'm great. How are you? Awesome. I'm doing fantastic. It's Friday. It's 3.15 and I'm ready to go. So I can't wait to have this interview. I'm excited. Me too. So like I mentioned in the brief intro, Katie, you are all over Facebook. There's a lot of denturism Facebook pages, but you started your own all about wanting to make denturism legal in your state of Illinois. So let's first ask you why. Why is it important to you that denturism becomes legal? You know, um, it's something that I've learned about a long time ago, and it's become a bit of a dream of mine. Unfortunately, right now, it's only legal in a handful of states, and moving to one of those legal states is not an opportunity for myself, just like a lot of other Americans. We're kind of stuck where our roots are laid. And so, you know, the more I've been in this industry and in dental technology, I, I've realized that it just really makes sense for patients to have access to a denturist. So I started doing some digging around and uh, tried to see if anything was happening in Illinois. And that's kind of where I've been led to and where I'm at right now is nothing's been going on. So I'm going to go ahead and start. Nice. Good for you. That's awesome. I love it. So currently you're a dental laboratory technician in-house at a corporate office, correct? Yes. So do you get to work with patients directly? Yes, I do. I'll start with saying I've been a denture technician for 17 years. The past seven, I have worked in a corporate dental office as the sole in-house technician. So when I got to this position and started seeing patients um, semi-regularly, I really fell in love with it. It was like I seen the fruits of my labor for the first time in 10 years and loved every aspect of it, loved being involved from start to finish. Um, and that's really where the dream started to grow a little bit more and more when I started working with patients. I could see that. We were talking just previously about how working with patients and creating smiles and seeing the emotional connection between changing lives, that's just such a rewarding feeling and, and doing what we do, there's nothing better. Absolutely. So what did you do before you got into the industry? Um, you know, I was 21 years old when I got into the industry. At the time, I was going to a community college majoring in fine art. And I had one of those moments where I realized I don't have very many job opportunities in fine art. And so I thought I was interested in dental hygiene. And I applied for a few programs and ended up on a waiting list for about two years. And in the meantime, there was a local lab about a half hour away from me. And my mom actually suggested why don't I apply for a job there and kind of see how I like it? I had never heard of a dental lab before. I had one crown at the time and um, I applied and I took a series of tests and I got hired and I absolutely fell in love with the lab. I really just decided that that's where I needed to be and the rest has been history. What did you start doing when you were at that lab, when you got hired? What was your first position? Okay, so the lab was the large full-service lab. It's still um, around today, and they're a very large lab and growing. Uh, when I was first hired in the denture department, I started off doing denture finishing and repairs. About two years into my employment there, I actually developed an allergy to monomer, which is uh -oh. the liquid part of the monomer polymer acrylic yeah that was that was a little bit testing and i had seen a few doctors and really wasn't getting anywhere with it um so this lab i worked for decided to put me into waxing and i started doing waxing try-ins and finishes eventually i started setting teeth 
and I specialized in setting teeth and was really, really good at it for a number of years. Now, when I switched jobs and went to the corporate side, I knew that I would be fabricating dentures from start to finish, and the concern about the monomer allergy was very real. For about six months, when I worked there, I was having breakouts with my hands, um, but the doctor, the dentist who I worked with was also medically trained in the Army, and he actually worked with me, and we found out that latex gloves, and for anyone listening who has this problem, latex gloves are amazing. They're the best barrier against monomer, and really, I've just found that I can work with it and around it. I just have to be extremely careful and conscious of my my working habits. You know, seven years now into doing full service dentures, you know, start to finish, I can work with monomer on a daily basis and have no problems. That's a lot of gloves you went through. (laughs) That's a really great story because you probably wouldn't have been able to do the whole, you know, A to Z, you know, with that allergy. So how did he realize that the the gloves, did you, was it just a a wing? Did you just try them on and realize that it worked or did he know something about it? So, yeah, so he was medically trained in the army and he knew that latex was going to be the best barrier. It's not foolproof. Mm -hmm. So if I do come into contact with monomer, I I have to remove the gloves, wash my hands immediately. And honestly, I can stay on top of it just by being conscious of it. Wow. Awesome. Are you allergic to them? Oh, (laughs) go ahead. Wow. We're terrible today. (laughs) Um, I know. Are you allergic to the monomer in the liquid state or after it's been turned into the acrylic? Only in the liquid state. Okay. Oh, crazy. Are you a um, CDT and removable at this point? Or are you looking to be or have any interest? You know what? I'm actually not. For as long as I've been doing this, I'm not a CDT. And I do have an interest in obtaining that. Well, good for you. I've got I've got a uh, a bunch of study materials I can turn you on to. I mean, I just it was just a question I was asking. We asked that to everybody. If you need any help, oh, I'm happy. I would appreciate that. Cool. So when did denturism enter your mind? How did you learn about it? Who introduced you to the idea? You know, I really don't remember when I first heard about it. I believe I was working at the previous lab, but. It didn't re-enter my mind until I was working with the current corporation and, and really working with patients. So to be honest with you, how this all started was a few years ago, I had tried contacting the National Denturist Association maybe two or three times over a couple of years, and I never had gotten a response. Recently, you know, it it just has been on my heart more and more and in my mind. And I reached out again, and I got a response. And that was from Sean Murray, who's the executive director. Uh And from there, I had spoke with her and Todd Young, Patrick Allen, who were both guests on your podcast, uh, maybe a year or so ago. Yeah, I got talking with, yeah, I, I started talking with some of these people. And I couldn't believe, you know, the enthusiasm behind it and the support. And I'm not sure who I was contacting the first couple times. He wasn't real active as he used to be with the NDA. So that's why I wasn't getting the response. But once I got a hold of the right people, it's just everything's falling into place. The connections I've been making, the support, the enthusiasm, all of it has just been tremendous. A huge, huge blessing. And when I realized there really wasn't anything actively happening in Illinois, it was one of those moments where I had to stand and say to myself, well, if no one else is doing it, why not you? And I can't say I'm the most qualified person to do it, but it's just like, let's give this a shot. I'm 110% in and I want to see where it goes. I know it's going to be a long journey, um, but I'm up for it. So like, how do you start the process? Like, how do you, how do you even learn the legislation and what you have to do and how do you do it? Have you been researching it online or, I mean, I know those guys are amazing, so they're probably helping mentor you, but in your own state, how do you, how do you go about doing something like that? I'm so, I'm so interested in that. Oh, it's still a learning process. Yeah. The legislative process is very confusing and I'm still learning it all the time. Like you said, they've been great mentors to me. They've really helped 
you know, just distinguishing between states. So basically, like Washington and Oregon, from what I understand, are states where they can get a law passed by a ballot initiative, which basically means if a group like us goes out and gets enough signatures, we can get this on the ballot for the public to vote to legalize it or not. Okay. Wow. Illinois is a legislative state, and so is Maine, which, honestly, this is a harder job to do in a legislative state. Obviously, you have just the entire aspect of politics that's going to help or hinder you through this. So we need to form an association, which we have. We will need to basically create awareness. This is a profession that not many people, even technicians, don't know about it. Yeah. And so what we need to do is we need to draft a bill and we need to find a representative who will support us and take this bill to the legislator for us. From there, it'll go through the committee and eventually to vote. Now, obviously, we do have some opposition in Illinois, and it is the home of the American Dental Association. So (laughs) we have a a couple different angles we need to um, tackle in that aspect. Mm -hmm. And Right now, we are still in the grassroots stage. We just formed our association a few months ago, so we're recruiting members. We're trying to share awareness through social media and our website and Facebook page. Um, Just word of mouth, too, and talking with other technicians and denture-wearing patients and see if they're interested in learning more. Well, you definitely got Elvis and my attention. I've uh, heard uh, even that your Facebook page is amazing. You got a ton of people on there. Oh, thank you. Social media is definitely the way to get the word out. So congrats on that part of it for sure. And the politics part of it for me has always been a um, stickler. You know, politics is just, uh, it's a difficult, slippery slope. And um, so good luck on that. Yes, it is. Thank you very much. We need it. Yeah, if you need any help, Elvis and I know Bennett uh, Napier from um, NADL. Maybe they can give you some advice if you need it along the way. Yes, and you know, I've I've been asked if I've reached out to the NADL yet, and I haven't. Illinois had a dental lab association that recently dissolved about the same time I was coming into interest with this in the, the fall of 2018. The hard thing with the NADL is that I think they're more focused on the benefits and um, the future with dental laboratories. I I don't really think that denturism is really um, something that they are interested in, in messing around with, but I'm not for sure about that. So we're kind of just doing this on our own so that we're not, you know, causing waves with their efforts and their agendas and their relationships with the ADA. Gotcha. Yep. Does that make sense? Absolutely. It does, but in the same breath, I would say that denturism is a part of the industry as much as dental laboratories is and as much as dentists are. And I think the only way we're going to benefit patients, which is the ultimate goal, is if all three can get along. Mm Mm-hmm. Because that's all we need to do is service the patients as best as we can. And what those two guys we had on before, Todd and uh, Patrick, there's no way dentist alone can handle the amount of denture work that's going to be coming down the line here in the next 10 to 12 years. Yeah, you are exactly right. Yeah, with all these aging patients. So we need to be ready to handle this work. And I think, honestly, denturism is a wonderful way to handle it. Yep. You know, Elvis, and and it's not just the aging population. I mean, in, in the demographic I live in, which is very rural, and not to say that it's a poor demographic, but, you know, dental care is almost a luxury this, these days. The The insurance policies have stayed the same. The costs have gone up. And people can't afford restorative work. In general, I struggle to to afford restorative work. Mm -hmm. You know, it it seems like getting your teeth extracted is an easy option. And then unfortunately, we have a huge population of even younger people who just are walking around with missing teeth. 
who would love to be able to have a partial or a denture and, and really just can't afford it. And that's the other benefit with denturism is when you cut off that middleman who is the dentist, you know, that markup for the product isn't there anymore. You're dealing directly with the denturist who's taking the impressions and fitting the dentures and processing and delivering. And it's just basically the cost and the time of the denturist work without the involvement of the dentist. Yeah. And their large staff and overhead and all that. Sure. Mm -hmm. And I would think that you could make a, a really good living at that as well. And, and um, you know, treat the patient really good and have a decent price and not have to deal with, or maybe you do have to deal with, but all of the insurance companies and all of the paperwork and red tape that goes along with that, they go right to you, you know, and they get everything done. So I could definitely see being a patient and dealing with a denturist rather than a dentist for sure. Yes. And, and in some states right now where it is legal, they are still fighting for recognition with insurance companies as well. So, you know, even where it's legal, they're still battling for recognition mm -hmm. uh, so that patients do have coverage through their dental insurance. But yeah, in general, just out of pocket cost, you know, paying cash or getting a small loan is, is much more affordable than seeing a dentist. And, you know, in general, too, your denturist the experience that, and you know this as lab technicians, even if in the fixed department, your experience is bar none. Yeah. And the education that's required to license someone to become a denturist, a lab technician with years and years of experience and troubleshooting and just knowing dentures and the, the necessary components to make a great denture. I mean, it, it all just falls together and makes perfect sense. And, and on that aspect, I'm going to go off a little bit here on a different subject, but I'm sure you've seen on our Facebook page, there's been times where I've compared the denturist profession to that of an ocularist who makes prosthetic eyes or an anaplastologist who would make prosthetic wow. facial features. Mm hmm both of these professions, you know, when somebody has an eye removed by an ophthalmologist, once they have gone through that healing period and the eye, you know, everything's healed up, the ophthalmologist refers them to an ocularist who, just like a denture technician or a, a denturist, takes the impression and sees that patient from start to finish. They take the impression, they mold and make the eye and color it. They have to be educated and aware of functions of the orbital socket and muscles around the eye and the tear ducts as well. So it's very, very similar in that way. And I have actually talked to an ocularist and an anaplastologist in the Midwest and great conversations. I mean, it's, it's an amazing, amazing careers that just are so similar. Do they have the same struggles that the denturists have? I mean, are they getting opposition from surgeons? No, they're not. Oh, yeah. What's the difference? The big difference is that the need for dentures and partials is so much bigger than prosthetic sure. facial yeah. features or eyes. Um, usually that's due to um, an illness or disease or an accident, which is pretty rare. But tooth loss is huge in the United States and around the world. Most everyone suffers from tooth loss. So, yeah, there's not really the opposition and there's no money to be made by the doctors and surgeons when it comes to those professions either. Mm. It all comes down to the dollar. Huh? Yeah, it kind of does. <laughs> I'm not saying a word. So you started an association. That was your first step. Yes. How did you start association? Did you have to like license that or uh, I don't know what the term is. Did you have to register it with the state of Illinois? Yes. And it was actually pretty easy. Um, I had to have a group of members who serve as our board. And basically, we had to fill out an application online with the secretary of state. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a fairly easy process, to tell you the truth. So from here, we just had to establish rules. And um, everything we are doing basically falls under the umbrella of the National Denturist Association. Mm -hmm. So even our our membership dues are, are the same as the National Denturist Association. And, and different states will differ a little bit. But to get started, that's basically, we're sticking with their ground rules. 
So did you have a bunch of friends that you contacted in the industry who um, lived around you and, and, you know, get the, get the interest up and ask them if they wanted to sit on the board and, and do all of that? I mean, how, who did you contact? It has to be everybody in your state, correct? Yeah, that's pretty much it. I started with people that I knew personally uh, who are great technicians and who are also very interested in this. We also have a dental assistant who is on the board and a local attorney as well. Wonderful. Okay. How often do you guys meet? Um, We've only maybe met two times since we've formed. We keep in contact through Facebook Messenger. We have a group message there. Everything's been a little bit slower than I originally anticipated. I was hoping to just move things along (laughs) along, full steam ahead. Yeah, you sound like an alpha female director. (laughs) I am a go-getter, that's for sure. Yep. But, you know, I I do have patience as well, and I'm really trusting right now that things will just fall into place as they have. So we're taking it one day at a time. Awesome. So you need to raise money or, um, you know, are there monies that need to be raised or how do you, um, what do you need? Like, what do you need from your industry? How can we help? Barb, I am super glad you asked. Yes, (laughs) we need money. (laughs) We do not have anyone funding us right now. So our money is coming through membership dues as well as donations. And as of right now, I do have a Facebook fundraiser running as well as a GoFundMe page. We looked into the legal cost. If we go the route of a lobbyist, we are looking at approximately $20,000 to retain a lobbyist for one year. Yeah. Um, it's going to be an expensive, expensive journey. So we, you know, it, it's all volunteer work right now and none of us are getting paid to do it. And we're really kind of putting in our own money whenever we need to or can. Yeah, Elvis and I feel your pain. Um, you know, when you start anything from the ground, grassroots up, um, you know, basically it comes right out of your pocket and your passion. So hopefully um, after this podcast launches, um, I don't know when Elvis and I are putting it out, but um, we'll put links to all the pages and really, really promote it. And hopefully, um, you know, you can you can see something change there. I think it's really important. And I've looked at the lobbyists and I know how expensive they are. And you really do need to have a lobbyist to go to, you know, go to the legislator. So good luck. Yes. Thank you. So currently you're raising money in order to bring on a lobbyist to take this to the next step because... You have to write a bill. Is that how your state yeah. works? Yes, it is. Yeah. Isn't that your state, Elvis, Illinois? Shut <laughs> up. I don't live in Illinois. That's a running joke. I'm that sorry. inside <laughs> joke is not funny anymore. He and I have a back and forth. I always say he lives in Illinois, but yeah. Lives in Illinois. Or the, the state of Chicago, as we refer to it. <laughs> Yeah. Out, yeah. Here in, out here in rural Illinois, <laughs> outsiders know us as the state of Chicago. How, how far are you from Chicago, if I might ask? I'm about two hours west. Oh, okay. I was going to say, you, we, I'd love to meet you. We're doing the race in a month, and uh, we'll be in Chicago. But if you're two hours, that's quite the drive. That's not too bad. Oh, it's not too bad. Yeah. I'd like to add as well that just recently, um, like I said, a lot of things have been falling in line, contacts and everything. I had gotten a phone call recently um, from an elderly man. His name is Les, and he had left me a voicemail, and he is the original president of the first Illinois Denturist Society. Wow. Now, this was back in the 70s oh, wow. and 80s when I was- You're kidding me. That is super cool. Yes. So right now, if you look at our website, we don't have any information on our history page, and it has been extremely hard for me to find information. I do know that a bill was attempted back in the 80s, I think the 80s, um, but the only information I can find online is, is the court documents. I can't find anything else. So I just happened to get a phone call from a man and I did go to his home in Chicago just uh, this past Wednesday and we had met. He turned 98 years old yesterday. Wow. And what an amazing... (laughs) 
So did you know, guys, that Whipmex manufactures a full array of 3D print resins featuring the only FDA cleared splint resin? The company printed resin offering includes its model materials in golden brown, ivory, white, and soon to be available gray. And it also includes surgical guide, burnout, and custom tray materials. The latest resin in the group of printable resins is called Verisplint, which is the very first and presently only FDA cleared print material that prints quickly and results in an accurate and economical hard splint. Their customers can now print a full build platform in under one hour at a cost of just five to six dollars per splint. This exceptional resin has been validated by the FDA on a SEGA 385NM DLP printers and is fully biocompatible. Have you started printing your splints yet? No, let's do it. Consider this. Printing them provides a considerably higher level of efficiency because it avoids several lengthy steps when compared with conventional methods. But most importantly, it brings a greater degree of design flexibility into the process, which improves both the lab and the patient's experience. Whether you're printing splints, models, surgical guides, casting patterns, or trays, consider increasing your productivity and your profitability with Whitmix Very Build Resins. Head over to Whitmix.com for more information. And thank you, Whitmix, for sponsoring our podcast. Thanks so much, Katie, for coming on the podcast. Join us next week as we dive into more into what it makes this removable technician so passionate about the patient and their experiences. Make sure to head over to this episode's show notes for a link to her website and Facebook page. I do know that she's looking to um, raise some funds and some money to help her get all of this done. So please check out her site. And if you would, maybe you can give her some money to uh, be successful on this. We honestly don't see a reason why this is not legal everywhere. And the only people suffering are the patients when it is. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. We appreciate it. So not too long ago, Barb and I got invited to the Zahn Expo, which is happening in Palm Beach, Florida, October 17th and the 19th. You know, there's a lot of conventions that happen, but this one takes a little unique turn on it. They do what's called tracks. So depending on what you want to accomplish while you're at the expo, you can either join the fixed prosthetic track, the removable prosthetic, the design for success, or they also have a business development track. So depending on what your goal is at the convention, you can kind of pick and choose the courses you want to take. Sadly, Barb and I could not attend due to scheduling conflicts Mm. and the fact that we're already doing two events right before. I highly suggest that people spread these things out a little bit. (laughs) We would appreciate it. You got to remember, Barb and I, we both have labs we're trying to run. We have family. We can't do them all. We would love to, but we can't do them all. But if you're in the area and have some interest, head over to this episode's show notes for a link to more information and to register. Thanks for the invite, Zon. So next up for us is Whitmix Digital Forum. It's sold out, but if you are one of the lucky ones to have a ticket, be sure to stop by and visit our booth. We will be there all weekend wanting to talk digital with the speakers and the attendees. If you want to make sure to get an interview, send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com and we can set something up. We're super excited for this event. Yeah, we appreciate it, Whitmix. Thanks for the invite. We're really looking forward to it. And remember, like us on Facebook and leave us a review on your favorite podcast listening device. We'd love to hear from our audience. And as always, thank you to Digital Dental and Whitmix for your support of our podcast. We love partnering up with companies that support our industry and believe in keeping dental laboratories relevant. And Elvis told me that at the summit, he got a lot of people coming up and talking to us about what we're doing and how amazing it is. So once again, I appreciate your brainchild of this podcast. And here's to the next five years, 10 years and 20. Uh, Five, what? (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) You mean we're going to make it till next week? I hope so. Yes. We're only going to talk about next week. Five, 10 years. I think we'll be, well, I'm not going to say what. I have no idea what we're going to be doing in five to ten years. (laughs) I'll still be in this industry, though. I assure you of that. I can guarantee you that, too. Yep. Loving every minute of it. Awesome, everybody. We'll talk to you next week. Yep. Have a good one. Bye.
and no dogs barking. They must like my voice. <laughs>